In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. This morning's Mass we offer for the intentions of Linda Hedekan and for the repose of the soul of Hank Tulin. And today the Church celebrates the feast of St. Lawrence of Brindisi, a 15th slash 16th century reformer of the Church and Capuchin friar. And so, my brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate this sacred mystery. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who for the glory of your name and the salvation of souls, bestowed on the priest St. Lawrence of Brindisi a spirit of counsel and fortitude, grant, we pray, that the same spirit we may, know, we may know what must be done, and through his intercession bring it to completion. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Micah. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock that belongs to you, which lives alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, Show us marvelous things. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of your possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing clemency. He will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He will show faithfulness to Jacob and unswerving, unswerving loyalty to Abraham, as you have sworn to our ancestors from the days of old. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response is, Lord, show us your mercy and love. Lord, show us your mercy and love. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath and turned from your hot anger. Lord, Lord show, show us your, your mercy, mercy and, and love. love. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations. Lord, show us your mercy and love. Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Lord, show us your mercy and love. And love. Oh. 
From the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees went out and conspired against Jesus how to destroy him. When Jesus became aware of this, he departed. Many crowds followed him, and he cured all of them. And he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not wrangle or cry aloud. And I'm reading the wrong gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. (laughs) While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. But to the one who had told him this, Jesus replied, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you. So um, I was going to spend about five minutes laying out the basic principles of an idea that is implicit in our Catholic life, but can often fly underneath the radar, um, which is that holding the authority does not make you equivalent to the authority. And that was going to go through some interesting literary analysis and blah, 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 blah. And then I read last Saturday's gospel. (laughs) And I was thinking, when is it going to get to that whole thing about mothers and yada, yada, yada? And then I was like, oh, no, we're getting to the end. Oh, I'm doing the wrong reading entirely. Looked up Saturday. Oh, man. So then I switched back. And I could have justifiably just kept on going. But the liturgy is meant to make the mysteries of God visible. And even if that makes me look like a fool, then so be it. This is what should happen. And I always want to be a dutiful son of the church, which means that I will do as the church offers me, and so I will do the reading of the day. And this is important to know. The structure of the readings was decided almost entirely arbitrarily. A bunch of guys, you know, when they were doing the lectionary after the Second Vatican Council, the um, Sacrosanctum Concilium says to them, you're going to reform the lectionary so that more people get more in contact with the Word of God. And then a bunch of Bible scholars are like, okay. And then they come up with a bunch of, they come up with the lectionary. And you can imagine, the bishops are not biblical scholars. They're like told, this is the lectionary. And they're like, okay, stamp. (laughs) And then it gets stamped and then it's now promulgated. And so it didn't come from the guy (laughs) you know like God didn't give the church and say here's the lectionary and everyone goes oh and then you know it's just this no it was so ridiculously human but this is the important part a person that can't submit to human authority can't submit to divine authority either one is practice for the other So if one person is constantly saying, it's like, well, you know, that's not the right thing, or that's not the right thing, and then constantly causing a fight over everything, I guarantee you, is building a habit of pride. A habit of pride that will gradually manifest itself. And it won't be a good thing. Because then they'll look to God and say, oh, you're wrong now. Because, you know what, the arbiter and standard of their judgment is not God, is not truth. It's themselves. 
and they can't handle embarrassment. I'm sure you've noticed this. Proud and arrogant people can't handle looking like a fool. They will deny, obfuscate, create all sorts of smoke screens to be able to maintain their dignity in the sight of the world. And the greatest of the saints thinks that's just nonsense. Stand like a fool every now and again. Be willing to be ridiculed. Now I'll give you an example. St. Lawrence of Brindisi is in fact one of these figures that renounces the world for the sake of the world. He became a Capuchin friar during the time of the Reformation, and um, what we call the Reformation, and he wanted to be able to help reform the church. And reform is a good thing, because reform means go back to what was intended. And this is the important part. Inside of that is the understanding that we haven't been doing has been, what has been intended. The arrogant and the proud will say, no, 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 we've been doing it, everything right all the time without problem. And Lawrence and Brindisi knew, not all of them, but many of the problems of Christianity of his day. He knew many of the corruptions that were going on in the church. He knew many of the trials and difficulties that were all endemic in the society at the time. But he wasn't so proud and arrogant that he thought that he was the arbiter and the judge. And I contrast this with what I'll call the simple figure of Martin Luther. You might have gotten the impression I don't have a lot of respect for him theologically. I have a lot of respect for Luther in many other areas, but theologically, no. Because in the end, Luther himself made the Reformation all about himself and his measure of righteousness. And if you want to see where it comes to its floor, I forget, I think it's Turbingen or something like that. He spends a long time trying to talk about the freedom of religious conscience against, imperial, uh, against the powers of man, one's direct obedience to God. <laughs> and then within a few years, there's a peasant revolt. Within a few years, there's a peasant revolt. And they think, oh, look, look at what Luther's giving us, this opportunity to stand up against our oppressors. And then Luther then comes out with a very big sermon. And the sermon's point was to say, obey your, obey your kings because God gave them to you. Step one. <laughs> Step two, when they wouldn't stop, he preached their annihilation. You get where I'm going with this? <laughs> Always be on the lookout, not in him. Now, you've seen it in him. I'm doing this under the presupposition that we as Catholics don't want to be like him. We as Catholics can be like him. When we want to take God's blessings for ourselves, and we don't realize how to consistently apply them to other people, I may be a priest of God, but I ain't Jesus. I will make mistakes, and I have to admit them, and I have to be willing to have the world see them, and to be held accountable by that very standard. And I must be willing to go back into my life and then realize, wait a second, you know this thing that I took for granted as a basic Christian principle? I, I'm, maybe I was wrong. Today's gospel, which is why I insisted on reading it, not just out of obedience, but because I had a sermon prepared for it, <laughs> um, is in fact this application. Jesus is beginning his public ministry. And Mary and the family of Jesus appear. And um, you can sense in all the different gospels, Jesus has a strange relationship with his family. Um, in Luke, it's recorded that when after the um, he's, after he gets lost in the temple, which is already quite hilarious, um, it's a very human story. Jesus just goes to the temple, and his mom and dad are like, "Where's our son?" We go find him. Um, and then after he comes back, and this is the amazing statement that happens at the end of that statement: he goes back into the house of Mary and of Joseph and is obedient unto them. What? <laughs> What? 
You'd think that if it was all about divine power and, and authority, then Jesus would be born, popping out of the womb and saying, all right, mom and dad, this is how it's going to go. Exact opposite. <laughs> he listens to them. Even when he's a rambunctious child that wanders off, he still obeys his parents. And then when he's doing his public ministry, when he starts his public ministry, you get the glimpse of his silence in his family. Because his family is shocked. <laughs> like, who is this dude? <laughs> we grew up with him. <laughs> you know, we know his, we know his dad. <laughs> There's the trick, right? Um, we know his father. So that tells you, too, that Mary and Joseph and Jesus didn't start broadcasting to the neighborhood about how special their boy is. Who's this guy? And then you can imagine then Jesus... Um, this is in John's Gospel, his relationship with his family even becomes clearer when around the Feast of Booths, um, B-O-O-T-H-S, on the Feast of Booths, his relatives come up to him and say, you know what you should do is you should take your miracle trick and bring it on tour. <laughs> and Jesus has no shortage of frustrated words with his family about this topic. And you'll notice they're treating him like a traveling, a traveling miracle man. And he's like, that's not what I'm about. You go to the festival. You do it. And then, of course, Jesus goes secretly. <laughs> so you get a glimpse of that inner family of Jesus, that Mary and Joseph understand him but don't know what he's about to do. His family members completely misunderstand his purpose. And then now that he's beginning his public ministry, you can then imagine what his family's thinking. It's like, <laughs> he's the local boy. Maybe we can get a few miracles for the family. <laughs> and by the way, this is one of the reasons why we don't like having priests and bishops in the area in which they're from. Oh, I knew him since he was a kid. He's our domestic family chaplain. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> one of the great blessings of being a convert is I have no relatives in church. <laughs> it's an absolute delight. So Jesus starts his ministry, and then his family starts coming in, and Mary's with them. So she wants to see her son, and the family is up there, and then they like, you know, we, he wants, get, get us through the crowd. We want to be with you. And Jesus' answer is, is who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? Whoever does the will of my father, that is the heart of it. And this is more than just a kind of theological puritanism of just like only those who are pure are on my side. He's also making another statement which is intimately connected with the very foundations of marriage itself. And that is why, this is from Genesis, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, what's interesting is that this is what we call a prelapsarian statement. This is one of those few statements about human nature that is before the fall, which means it's a part of God's original intent God's original intent for the human race. And every one of you who's had kids bring home their girlfriend or boyfriend knows exactly how this works. The peace of the family is ruined. And then that first Christmas, maybe after they get married, but not so much these days, but that first Christmas, then there's that big fight. Well, whose house are they going to for Christmas? And you watch the domestic impulse begin a small little war <laughs> and <laughs> it's in a macabre sense kind of funny <laughs> because all of those family traditions all of a sudden start going <laughs> and they start crumbling and the family sees it as a betrayal it's like can you believe that my son is spending Christmas with his wife. Horrible! And then you have 
to sit back for five seconds and go, what on earth is wrong with me? I should be encouraging that. I should want that. But what a family wants is not necessarily what it needs. Just in the same way, we can in families silence problems for the sake of happiness. And then years down the road, we wonder, where did the happiness go? It was a long habit of silence and obfuscation. Just by the way, like the Catholic Church in the 16th century, what you do in the family, you wind up doing in the church. Yeah, I know, uh, <laughs> it's wrong for a priest to, you know, <laughs> make large, large, large amounts of money by selling all these different things. Yeah, I know, it's a problem, but, you know, uh, um, yeah, I know that Jesus said this, and you can't own people, and, you know, corruption and everything. But, you know, it's all in the family. I don't want to criticize my little son, who's the Archbishop of Cologne. We'll just let that go. And sure enough, it did. And it will again and again. And what it takes is a renewed courage. A renewed courage to trust that in every stage and in every age, God has not hidden his will from us. He's always told us, and we heard it in yesterday's first reading too, that he remains faithful to his covenants. That those who do his will won't be spared suffering, but they will overcome it. And that, that mutual submission that God intended from the foundation of the world comes from the very heart of God himself. God also submits himself. God also is humble. And God delights in it. And I think the reason why we are so miserable and so constantly engage in wars and conflicts internationally or domestically, or domestic domestically, is we're always trying to get the leg up. But I don't think that's how God thinks. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever by the mystery of this water and wine. May we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it'll become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And may the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Most merciful God, who were pleased to create in blessed Lawrence of Brindisi the new man in your image, the old having passed away, graciously grant that renewed like him, we may offer you the acceptable sacrifice of conciliation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as on the festival of St. Lawrence of Brindisi you bid your church rejoice, so too you strengthen her by the example of his holy life, teach her by his words of preaching, and keep her safe in answer to his prayers. And so with the company of angels and saints we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, St. Mary Magdalene, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and Gary our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. And to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. By the power of this sacrament, Lord, we pray, lead us always in your love through the example of blessed Lawrence and bring to fulfillment the good work you have begun in us until the day of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended.